Given the grand lottery that determines Hollywood's successes and failures, it's worth wondering how a bona fide American masterpiece like Brian De Palma's Scarface has remained such an all-time great movie that continues to be celebrated 40 years later. After all, the movie faced harsh blowback from the Cuban community at the time, the production was halted by severe weather events, star Al Pacino suffered cuts and burns during production, Michelle Pfeiffer was roundly rebuked by the studio, Oliver Stone was grappling with his own cocaine addiction prior to filming, the budget ballooned out of Control and production went three months over schedule, the film was slapped with an X rating by the MPAA three times for excessive violence, the critics rejected the movie's controversial violence and profane language. What the fuck was that? What you just did? That's it. That's what you do. Disgusting. And perhaps most notably, Brian De Palma replaced legendary director Sidney Lumet and hired Oliver Stone to pen the screenplay, which is now often hailed as one of the best scripts in Hollywood history. Yet. In the end, despite the protests, escalating costs, overwhelming odds, constant shakeups, and nagging production woes, Scarface proved that even in the censor-heavy 1980s that neutered original filmmaking, a major movie studio like Universal could team with a genuine movie star like Pacino, old-school power producer like Martin Bregman, and an all-tour-driven director like De Palma that, just like the 1932 classic version of the movie, ascended to strike a vital nerve in the collective consciousness of pop culture that continues to resonate to this this very day. They're poachers! Say hello to my stinky little friend! Oh! A minor miracle indeed. It's time to chop this one up and find out once and for all what the f happened to Scarface. According to Movie Line, it was Al Pacino's idea to remake Scarface after he stumbled into the Tiffany Theater in Los Angeles in the early 80s and watched the original 1932 Howard Hawks version starring Paul Muni. Pacino immediately called his manager and Hollywood producer Martin Bregman, who agreed to remake the film and hired Sidney Lumet to direct, after the three had previously worked on Dog Day Afternoon. Kiss me, man. What? Kiss me. When I'm being I like to get kissed hey, a come lot. Come on, come on, come on. While Pacino wanted to retain the 1930s period of the original, it was Lou Metz's idea to contemporize the story and set it in modern day Miami, and to turn Tony Montana into a Cuban character who emigrates to America during the Mariel Boatlift a topical news story at the time. Despite Lumet's invaluable contributions, he and Bregman had a falling out over creative differences while the film was in development. Lumet wanted to make a more political picture, chastising the Reagan administration for ushering in the cocaine epidemic of the 1980s. Chichi. Chichi. Get the Bregman disagreed, ultimately replacing Lumet with Brian De Palma, who loved the script so much he declined to direct Flashdance. It was De Palma who hired Oliver Stone to rewrite the script, which Stone initially refused to do due to his dislike of the original Scarface. But after sitting down with Lumet directly, Stone had a change of heart. Stone admitted Sidney had a great idea to take the 1930s American Prohibition gangster movie and make it a modern immigrant gangster movie dealing with the same problems that we had then that were prohibiting drugs instead of alcohol. There's a prohibition against drugs that's created the same criminal class as prohibition of alcohol created the mafia. Once Stone had a workable angle for a story, he began researching the material by interviewing police and criminals throughout Florida and the Caribbean to achieve the utmost authenticity. According to Stone, it got hairy. It gave me all this color. I wanted to do a sun-drenched, tropical, third-world gangster cigar, sexy Miami film. Hey! Stay away from her. Racked by his own cocaine addiction at the time, Stone flew to Paris to write the script. I moved to Paris to go out of the cocaine world too, because that was another problem for me. I was doing coke at that time, and I really regretted it. I got into a habit of it, and I was an extreme personality. I did it, not of an extreme or to a place where I was as destructive as some people, but certainly to where I was going to stale mentally. I moved out of LA with my wife at the time and moved back to France to try and get into another world and see the world differently. And I wrote the script totally fucking cold sober. You want a job, Ronnie? Sure, Tony. Okay, then you call me tomorrow. Hey man, you got a job. Huh? Part of Stone and Bregman's independent research entailed gaining access to a wealth of criminal records and video evidence from the U.S. Attorney's Office and Organized Crime Bureau. The controversial early scene in which Tony watches a man become gorily sliced with a chainsaw was taken from a real-life case in Miami at the time, which De Palma felt was vital to sharing to the public to educate them about a new kind of hyper-violent gangster in the world that differed from what audiences were used to in classic Italian mafia movies like The Godfather. Leave the gun. 
take the cannoli. According to Stone, I didn't want to do an Italian mafia movie. We'd had dozens of these things. Ironically enough, despite retaining Lumet's key story ideas and themes, Stone later said, Sidney Lumet hated my script. I don't know if he'd say that in public himself. I sound like a petulant screenwriter saying that. I'd rather not say that word. Let me say that Sidney did not understand my script, whereas Bregman wanted to continue in that direction with Al. As for the name Antonio Montana, and you, what you call yourself? Stone confessed that he named the character after his favorite football player, Joe Montana, because he was a big 49ers fan. Water boys killed him. He's the best tackler I've seen since Joe Montana. Joe Montana was a quarterback, you idiot. I said Joe Montana. Stone was paid $275,000 for the script making him the highest paid screenwriter at the time. Once the final script was in the shooting shape, the casting process for Scarface began in earnest, which presented its own series of combative hiccups. While Pacino insisted on playing Tony Montana from the start, believe it or not, Robert De Niro was offered the role but turned it down. Pacino admitted that it was De Niro who encouraged him to play Tony Montana and suggested hiring Brian De Palma to direct. De Niro also said if the project didn't work out, he'd consider starring as Tony with Martin Scorsese at the helm. Imagine that, a De Niro Scorsese Scarface could have existed in an alternate movie history. You. No. No. You. You're very good, you. No. You are very good, There's you. a lot more to it than that. You're very good, you. There are underlying things you that you understand me? No, you're, you're right. You're right on the money. As cool as that may have been, 40 years later, it's impossible to imagine anyone other than Pacino and Da Palma. Once Pacino was hired, he began a rigorous workout routine that included extensive knife training and boxing with professional boxer Roberto Duran to retain an athletic physique. Duran actually helped mold the aggression of Montana, which Pacino claimed noted had a quote, certain lion in him. Pacino also drew inspiration from Meryl Streep's character in Sophie's Choice, another immigrant looking to realize the American dream. Pacino also spent six months perfecting his human accent for the film. Manny, look at this pelican fly. Come on, pelican. Stephen Bauer, who plays Tony's best friend Manny, was cast in the role without auditioning. John Travolta was actually considered for the role, who De Palma just worked with on the box office failure blowout, but the casting director spotted Bauer waiting around the audition room and instantly sensed he was right for the part. When you do that, they know. They know what? They understand. They, they go crazy. And Bauer became the only authentic Cuban actor in the entire film. According to Pacino, Bauer helped him with his Cuban accent and Spanish dialogue thanks to roughly one month of rehearsals that allowed them to fine tune the character. To stay in the skin of Tony and remain as authentic as possible, Pacino asked the director of photography, John Alonso, to communicate with him by only speaking Spanish on the set. Costing today? Costing? Costing? Casting. 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 Far more contentious was the casting of Michelle Pfeiffer as Elvira, Tony's sexy ice queen trophy wife whom he can't quite connect with. According to Bregman, Pacino was not sold on Pfeiffer for the role due to the lack of movie experience following her only appearance in Grease 2. He balked at the idea of her even getting an audition. De Palma wasn't hot on the idea at first either. Instead, Pacino lobbied for Glenn Close. <laughs> When Close was not deemed sexy enough by the producers, Martin Bregman fought hard to cast Pfeiffer in the role despite a relative newcomer. However, Universal wanted big names like Jane Fonda, Goldie Hawn, and Barbara Streisand. Before Pfeiffer was originally cast, the actresses who auditioned for the role included Gina Davis, Courtney Cox, Sharon Stone, Kelly McGillis, Harry Fisher, and many more. Those who turned it down outright included Melanie Griffith, Rosanna Arquette, Kim Basinger, Kathleen Turner, Jennifer Jason Lee, Deborah Winger, and others. Sigourney Weaver, Karen Allen, Jessica Lang, and Jamie Lee Curtis were also considered for the role. Wait a minute! before Pfeiffer earned it during her first meeting with De Palma. Once the casting process was complete, Scarface officially began principal photography with a planned budget of roughly 10 to 15 million. In the end, the budget ballooned to anywhere from 23 to 37 million dollars depending on the reports at the time. The film shoot would last 24 weeks from November 22nd, 1982 to May 6th, 1983, leaving less than seven months to edit the film before the wide release on December 9th, 1983. For Universal, the pressure was mounting to release a financial hit to atone for the 
growing costs of making the movie. While Scarface was originally planned to be filmed in Miami, Florida, the Miami Tourism Board were so afraid that the negative depiction of violent drug dealers would hinder their tourism economy. The production was then forced to relocate to California where most of the movie would end up being filmed. Moreover, the local Cuban community in Miami felt they were being negatively depicted and protested. According to De Palma, we scouted locations in Florida and were going to shoot the movie in Florida, but the Cuban community became so outraged at how we were representing them and basically ran us out of town. There were a number of threats made and we thought it would be best if we moved the production. As a result, only two weeks were spent filming in Miami and the rest of the movie was filmed in Los Angeles and Santa Barbara as well as a few pickup shots in New York. For instance, Tony's lavish mansion was filmed in El Fuertes, a real location in Santa Barbara built based on Roman style architecture. It sure, it's big enough. But look at the location. <laughs> In addition to real locations, several ornate sets were built on the Universal backlot, including the neon-drenched interiors of the Babylon nightclub that Tony often spends time in, luxuriating with coke field excess. According to De Palma, I wanted to do a kind of high-tech, neon, acrylic, vibrant pastels instead of your usual dark film noir. Despite the move from Miami to Los Angeles, production was postponed twice due to extreme weather incidents in California, which included unseasonably cold temperatures and partially delayed the production schedule by three months. According to Stone, the movie was a nightmare to make. Went three months over, and I was on that set all the way to the end. They kept me there. It was like, who do you have to f to get off this ship? It was so slow the way they made it because Brian's not an energy guy and Al's a retail guy. It cost too much, went over, and was a black sheet from the get-go with Universal. The costly production delays also resulted from a slew of onset mishaps and dangerous accidents that caused filming to postpone. For example, during the hyper-violent finale in which Tony succumbs to 10 brutal gunshot wounds, Pacino accidentally tripped during a fight sequence and fell on an M14 machine gun, badly burning his left hand on the blazing marker. Pacino was instantly taken to Sherman Oaks Burn Center and production was shut down for roughly two weeks while he recovered. If that wasn't bad enough, a premature bomb explosion injured two stuntmen while Pacino was in the hospital, all but ensuring that Scarface was doomed from the start. During the scene in which Omar is hung to his death from the helicopter, De Palma claims, we hung F. Murray Abraham from a crane basically, but the stuntman, Dick Diker, had to leap out of the helicopter with a noose around his neck. That had never been done before. In the penultimate shot of the film in which Tony is shot to his death and falls off the balcony into the blood sodden pool below, famed stuntman Tom Elliott performed the fall without any FX or safety wire, which was extremely dangerous considering there wasn't any padding in the cement pool and Elliott was descending from 12 feet high into a pool of less than 2 feet of water. After the first take, the Palma felt Elliot's posture was too balletic and told him to do it again. A problem with the camera's speed ruined that second take. Even though he was forced to hold his breath for a long time after landing, Elliot nailed the stunt on the third take and that's the one you see in the movie. Eagle-eyed viewers can even spot wet spots on the carpet around the pool from the previous two takes. Even during the audition process of the iconic scene in which Tony and Elvira argue over their sham marriage, Pfeiffer lost herself in the moment and threw dishes and glassware that broke on the floor and cut Pacino's finger. And everyone comes running over to me, checking me out, yeah, their yeah. blood, where am I cut? They're not finding anything, there are no cuts on me. Oh, I look no. over and Al is bleeding. Oh no, oh my gosh, you cut Al Pacino? I cut Al Pacino. Oh my gosh. Yet somehow, all the real brushes with danger during production only make the smashing success of the movie more impressive. In a kind of timeless art imitates life parable that continues to add to the movie's growing legend as an all time great American gangster classic. Speaking of the iconic final shootout, it's worth noting that De Palma invited his longtime friend Steven Spielberg onto the set one day while the climactic sequence was being filmed. Spielberg suggested placing a low angle camera outside as Sosa's goons swarm in on Tony's mansion and first enter the house while using grappling hooks. The single shot directed by Spielberg has been retained in the final cut, putting a cool button on De Palma and Spielberg's days together at USC Film School not too far away or long before. When the horizon's at the bottom, it's interesting. When the horizon's at the top, it's interesting. When the horizon's in the middle, it's boring as shit. Five cameras in total were used to film the harrowing finale. According to Alonzo, we had one on a crane and we had two down below. Yeah, yes, yeah, sir. We had a, a slow motion camera that was prepared to shoot the stuntman as he got hit or Puccino as the squibs were going off. We had one camera in slow motion. Probably took. Uh, more than half a day just to line up 
exactly where the cameras were going to go. And it took two days to get the stunt of the man falling. Because Pacino burned himself and was absent for two weeks, De Palma had extra time to film the hyper-violent climax, which only reinforces the themes of 80s excess and material indulgence that permeates the entire movie. Part of what makes the harrowing climax so visceral and authentic are the visible gun flashes that appear on camera, lending the scene a real sense of fire and brimstone. Alonzo credits the special effects supervisors for designing, quote, this synchronization system for the weapons so that the camera shutter is open to see the flame and Pacino can't fire it unless the shutter is open. And it sort of drove Pacino crazy a little bit because he pressed the trigger and it wouldn't fire until the camera was perfectly in sync with his flash. And it got a little testy there because he wanted the freedom of it. Uh, but it worked out very good. These men were very, are very talented men. As for the multi-million dollar question of what substance was used to replicate cocaine consumption on screen, it was not real cocaine, contrary to popular rumors. Instead, powdered baby milk was used. However, some say a baby laxative was used to replicate the cocaine. Whatever the substance was, something Pacino likes to keep a secret to retain the mystique of the character, it wasn't easy to snort, according to the Palma, because it would get in your nose and I would be blowing his nose all the time. As a result, Pacino's nasal passes was partly damaged while filming. As for Tony Montana's Say hello to my little friend. During the incendiary shootout, the firearms happened to be a custom M16 with an M203 39mm grenade launcher. He also used the custom Colt AR-15 during the shootout. Several prop replicas of the M203 were produced and recycled for subsequent Hollywood productions in the 80s. Among them, Clint Eastwood used one in Heartbreak Ridge, and Schwarzenegger used one in Predator. Yep, that's Dutch rocking Tony Montana's grenade launcher, also at Shady Ass Colombians. Go figure. Sorry, that's not kosher. When it came to scoring the film and creating a unique soundscape for Tony's coke-riddled world, De Palma routinely denied Universal's attempts to lace the film with contemporary pop music needle drops. Instead, De Palma hired Oscar-winning Italian record producer Giorgio Moroder to create the score based on his work on Paul Schrader's American Gigolo. The unforgettable Sith New Wave electronic orchestrations have become an indelible part of the movie, perfectly echo the characters and the actions they take. Thankfully, De Palma has shot down every request Universal has made to replace the score with hip-hop music, something the studio wanted to do for the 20th anniversary in 2003. Roughly six weeks before Scarface was set to be released in theaters, the MPAA suddenly tagged the film with an X rating, citing the infamous opening Chainsaw Massacre as their primary concern. With well over 200 F-bombs in the film as well, profanity was another issue for the rating board. The censors requested removing the shot of a severed arm hanging from the shower curtain rod, which De Palma never intended to use anyway. Knowing the severed arm would be controversial, he wittingly sacrificed it to be removed so his real intention of doing a more is less suggestive approach would remain intact. De Palma made the cuts and resubmitted the film, only to receive an X rating again. Then I cut it back a third time, says the Palma, and they were sort of fixated on how many gun hits were on the clown. The clown? Or worry about gun hits on the clown? So this is the third time I sent it back, but I wasn't going to cut it anymore. I felt it was against what the material was, and I thought it was affecting the dramatic thrust of the movie. Along with Martin Bregman, De Palma entered legal arbitration with the MPAA to appeal the decision and resolve the issue. All this just weeks before the movie's premiere and the increasing pressure of Universal needing a hit film. Bregman brought in a host of professionals, including three psychiatrists, to testify as expert witnesses to argue that Scarface was actually an anti-drug film and that the world needed to know about the kinds of dangerous criminals that were out there. In the end, Bregman and De Palma made such compelling arguments that they won in a landslide 18-2 vote and got the MPAA to give Scarface an R rating in the nick of time. The best part of the ruling is that because all three versions De Palma submitted were given an X rating, he wisely went back and submitted his original version rather than the third cut he made with all the excised footage. This means the version of Scarface that we all know and love has not been compromised at all. It's 100% the version De Palma intended to release. I make a couple of moves, a mill here, a mill there, you got it, okay? Ironically enough, outside of Eddie Murphy, Martin Scorsese, and a few others who attended the premiere, Hollywood mostly hated the film when it was released. According to AMC's DVD, Much More Movie, Cher loved the movie. Lucille Ball was incensed over the graphic carnage and bad language, Dustin Hoffman fell asleep watching it, and writers Kurt Vonnegut and John Irving walked out after the notorious chainsaw scene. 
Critically speaking, outside of Roger Ebert and Vincent Canby and a few others, the movie was met with harsh negative reviews that have all since been proven pretty inaccurate and wrong-headed. Moreover, negative word of mouth didn't hurt the film's box office success. It arguably helped fuel the film's toward popularity which also took off when the movie was released on home video with the subsequent rise of VHS. As for Al Pacino, he's publicly stated that Tony Montana is his favorite character that he's played in a movie. He was an asshole before. Hoo-ah! Now all he is is a blind asshole. Hoo-ah! According to Oliver Stone, when I saw the film, I was very proud of it. You know, one of my children. I go into the New York subways and I hear dialogue from the picture. I knew that it hit a nerve. Scarface premiered in a star-studded New York movie house in December 1983, before opening wide a week later. The film grossed $45 million domestically and 66 globally, good enough to earn back its bloated budget, turn a healthy profit, and justify the painstaking efforts, protests, threats, legal hurdles, and onset mishaps in the process. Although the film was summarily dismissed by critics and many esteemed Hollywood luminaries who were offended by the violence and profanity. Burn this. I'm sorry? This must never be seen by anyone. The film went on to become an all-time beloved cult classic that inspired countless rappers like Ghetto Boys and video games like GTA Vice City. Even Saddam Hussein named his money laundering operation Montana Management after the movie. I have had enough of you! The movie also inspired the 2007 video game Scarface The World Is Yours, set in an alternate reality in which Tony survives the mansion massacre, rebuilds his cocaine empire, and vows revenge on Sosa and his men. In 2001, rapper Cuban Link was tapped to write and star in a Scarface sequel titled Son of Tony, but the project was ultimately canceled. Universal has also been planning a quasi-remake of Scarface since 2011, with several names attached in the past decade. But perhaps I've said too much. Honestly, the lore and legend of the movie are so profound and so timeless that it feels like we could go on forever here. Come here, give me a kiss. Come here. Come here. Hey. Hey. Hey, f you, man! But that is more or less what the f happened to Scarface. Despite the controversial material, the intense blowback and rabid protests from the Cuban community and Miami Tourism Board, the costly production delays and swollen budgets, the perilous onset mishaps, and the critical response, the movie endured all the potential pitfalls that could have easily sunk the production at any time along the way. In the end, America is still a meritocracy, and the bottom line is that Scarface is simply one of the best movies ever crafted, bar none. Now you're talking to me. Perhaps Brian De Palma sums it up best at the end of Making of Scarface, in which he says, So in a traditional Hollywood way, where we have a great producer, and a great actor, and a great director, and a great screenwriter, I think we made a really great movie. 40 years later, and it's safe to say one thing about Scarface and Tony Montana, the world is yours indeed. Me, I want what's coming to me. Oh, well, what's coming to you, Tony? The world, Chico. And everything in it.